This morning we are continuing a series we have been doing for several weeks now, looking at various Old Testament characters and deliberately focusing on those who we maybe have not looked at uh, very often, those who we're not as familiar with. As I've said before, we all have heard probably numerous lessons about Moses and Abraham and Isaac, but there are some others that we have not uh, talked about so much. And Yehoshua is one of those that we probably haven't talked a whole lot about. If you think about how throughout the pages of the Bible, we find examples of extraordinary and courageous women. Yehoshua is no exception. She showed great courage during a time of great wickedness. Just from the text that Brother Dan read a moment ago, we recognize already that this was a time of great heartache, of great wickedness, and what she did, which we'll talk about more in a moment, put herself and her husband at great risk, but she was very courageous in her actions. We think about Yehoshua, her name literally means Jehovah has sworn, Jehovah has sworn, and as we have been doing our Bible reading, and we're in the Old Testament right now, and there's always coming upon names, and of course we stop and sometimes we look at the, the, what those names mean. And they're very interesting. In fact, uh, I forget what the name was now. I couldn't pronounce it if I did anyway. Uh, from a few nights ago that we were reading, and it was about a young lady. Her name meant disease. And I thought, boy, how unfortunate. <laughs> uh, but other names, their meaning is so much better, like Jehoshabas. Her name meaning Jehovah has sworn. We find an alternate spelling in 2 Chronicles 22, verse 11, with Jehoshabeth, meaning Jeho- Jehovah had, or Jehovah rather, is an oath. And so we find really there is that her name is that is a reference to the promises, really, of God. Jehovah has sworn. Jehovah is an oath. Well, if we know anything about the promises of God, we know that He always keeps them, doesn't He? And so it's encouraging to find a name that means Jehovah has sworn or Jehovah is an oath. Jehoshaphat uh, was also, or Jehoshaphat rather, was the wife of Jehoiada. And his name uh, means literally Jehovah knows. And he was a high priest during the reign uh, of Elitha during this time. And so he is the husband of Je- Jehoshaphat. And now we think about... The, the evil queen, as I'm going to refer to her in just a moment, uh, her name meant afflicted of the Lord. It's amazing sometimes how the name fits the person. Afflicted of the Lord. Now there are those today who, or those also rather in the Old Testament, have names that mean certain things, and it shows their courage through diff- really through difficult times. But that's not the case with this wicked queen here, with uh, Alathia however you want to pronounce that, but uh, her name meaning literally afflicted of the Lord. And so our first main point this morning as we move on past the meaning of their names is looking at the evil queen. Now when I was preparing this, I thought it would be nice to have a picture of an evil queen like we think about from maybe some of the Disney movies, but all those are copyrighted so you can't do that. But the evil queen is how I view her, and as we go through this and look at this, you understand why she was an evil queen. Now, evil is a strong word really to use because we talk about some people today who we say, you know, they're not as faithful as they should be. We say, well, maybe they're, 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 they're no longer really a member because we haven't, you know, there's they're nothing to indicate that they are. And then you also have those who are sinners and do things where it's not right in the sight of God. And then you also have those who are evil, which to me are not just those who do wrong in the sight of God, but they also encourage others to do the same. And so when I, when I read about people who do those types of things, I believe they're more than just wrong or sinners. I, it seems they're more evil because they're leading others astray as well. Well, we find in 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 1, the murders in which she would be involved in. In 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says, uh, Lathia, the mother of Ahazai, saw that her son was dead. She arose and destroyed all the royal heirs. Now, destroyed, we take to understand, and, and we know from the very next verse, means that she began killing those who would have a rightful 
claim to the throne. Now, when I, when I was reading through this and studying this, I thought, this sounds like something out of a Hollywood movie. Some medieval movie where they're killing all the heirs so someone wicked could take the throne. But this isn't fiction, or this isn't fake. This is real. She saw that her son was dead, and she arose, and the Bible says she destroyed all the royal heirs. Now, it takes, there are those throughout the Bible at certain times that say it, it takes a special kind of, of evil, and that's what she possesses here, a special kind of evil, because this would include killing children, wouldn't it? Now, we know how we feel as Christians, or how we should feel, about abortion. Now, think about the shooting there in California where the, the news points out the individuals trying to gain access to the elementary school, which makes it clear that children were targets. Special kind of evil. And that's the same idea we find here. She was killing the royal heir. She was killing children of various ages who had a royal claim to the throne. And why did she do so? Because she wanted to be queen. She wanted the power that did not belong to her. She murdered all those who would be heirs to the throne, or she attempted to. This means she, she was killing children. Now think about this. Does this sound familiar? Has there ever been another case in the Bible where this has happened? Absolutely. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and sent forth and put to death all the male, that is, children who were in Bethlehem and all in its districts for two years and under, from two years and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. This is a reference to the time when Christ was newly born, and he was trying to find him, he was hunting him like we would hunt a wild beast. And he just determines, you know what? Forget it. Any male child under the age of two, kill them all. Special kind of evil, isn't it? And yet we find that even in the Old Testament. There are other occasions we read about children being killed. We know that idolaters who worship the god of Molech are recorded by historians how they would lay their children on the, some would say on the outstretched arms of Molech. Some historians could say it could have been done differently. It doesn't matter. The point is they killed their children in order to worship a false god. Now we find here Herod was killing children because he was afraid that Jesus would come and take away his throne, his physical throne. Which is very interesting because today, of course, looking back, if he would had allowed, if he would not have done this, if he had, if he would have said, you know what, let's see what happens and see if he really is going to be a threat, he would have found out he was no threat at all, right? Christ said many times, my kingdom is not of this world. We will try to make him king. He fled. But as a child, that's not what Herod saw. And so he killed every child he could, uh, every male child he could only under the age of two. And we find this evil queen in 2 Kings 11, verse 1, did the same thing. Now, it takes what I consider to be a dark heart to do things such as this. Very rarely, but sometimes, you come across articles and interviews of those who've had abortions, and they talk about the pain they still feel and the regret they still feel because they realize, too late, that they have done something wrong. They may not say it sinful because they're not, some are, may not be Christians, but they say they recognize it's wrong. And there are even support groups for those who have gone through abortions because of the mental anguish that follows it. Friends, here's a hint. If it requires, if there is a hotline regarding the same action you're involved in, it's probably not a good idea. People say, what's wrong with gambling? What about Gamblers Anonymous? What's wrong with alcohol? What about Alcoholics Anonymous? You know, there is no Christian Anonymous, is there? There's no hotline for that because there's nothing wrong with being a Christian, obviously. But sin has consequences. People having abortions mean they have to go through therapy and a lot of uh, various treatments to try to help them, if they ever can, overcome the actions which they have taken place, which had taken place. It takes a dark heart. The actions of this evil queen shows her heart had been darkened by sin, selfishness, and hatred. 
These ingredients led to the murder of the innocent. And we find the same idea in Proverbs 6, verses 16 and 17, when we find the things, some of the things the Lord hates. He lists among them, in verse 17, a proud, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, which would include what Herod did and what the queen did in, in, there in St. Kings 11. Innocent blood. What does that mean? It means they are harmless. It means they are carrying no guilt. It means they have done no wrong, no sinful thing. Innocent blood. And it's listed among the things, one of the things the Bible says the Lord hates. Now, hate is a strong word. There are a lot of things I despise. Recently, dealing with repair men, I despise dealing with those types of things. I don't hate it, but I do highly despise it. The Lord says here he hates these things. Why is that? Because these are all things that separate people from God. That's why he hates them. And we should as well. This woman, this queen we read about here, actually advised her own son to do evil, and he did so. Second Chronicles chapter 22, beginning in verse 1, says, Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahazai, his, his youngest son, king in his place. With the raiders, he came with the Arabians into the camp and killed all the, other son, all the older sons. You notice here a trend, they're killing everybody else, you could have had it. So Ahazai, the son of Je- Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Ahazai was 42 years old when he had become came king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Amari. He, he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahath, talking about Amari. For his mother advised him, notice, to do wickedly. Can you imagine to purposely... Tell your children to do wicked things. Now, does she say, go out and be evil? Probably not. But you think she said, go out and do whatever you want? It's a thin line, isn't it? You make your own decision, go out and do whatever you want to do. That's what a lot of people do today. Don't tell me how, you know, don't, don't, don't tell my child what not to do. Just don't make your own decisions. I think our jails are, full, are filling up with wicked People are doing wrong things. Verse 3, she advised him to do wickedly. Verse 4, therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Not just in the sight of men. It wasn't that men didn't like it. It's that God viewed it as being evil because it was against his commandments. Therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab. For they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. You notice that there in verse 4, what they said? They were counselors to him, to his destruction. Mean what? To his harm? They weren't good counselors. Why? Because they're wicked. Verse 5, he also followed their advice. This should remind us of how important it is to surround us with surround ourselves with godly people. Because when you surround yourselves with wicked people, you're going to get wicked advice. And what's going to happen? You're going to go down the road of sin. And so just logically, from a read here, it's not a good idea to be surrounded by those who are going to encourage you to do evil and also those who who will do nothing to prevent you from doing evil. You know, it's one thing to encourage people to say, do whatever you want. It's another thing for people to say, well, I don't care what you do, I'm not going to stop you. Whether you're encouraging someone or you just say, well, it's wrong, but I'm not going to say anything to them about it. That's just as bad, isn't it? As Christians, if we are doing something wrong, sinful, we're not saying, well, I don't like how he's done that. That's what we're talking about. We're saying that's going to separate them from God, and we say nothing. Are we not allowing them to go out and do evil? Well, absolutely. But we find here his mother advised him, as did his counselors, to do evil, and he did in the sight of the Lord. And so, for that reason, we should not be surprised that her own actions are evil. Now, let's look at what happens next. We find some desperate actions in desperate times. When children are being murdered, that would classify as desperate times, wouldn't you think? Today, do we live in desperate times? Absolutely. Children are being murdered every day. 
We have acts of violence that happen several times a week at various places, either throughout our country or throughout the world. We live in desperate and uncertain times because of the actions of others around us. That is not to say that God is not in control, but we cannot control the actions of others. And because of that, we live in desperate times. We find there in 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 2, where she, that is, Jehoshaphat, will rescue the innocent. Verse 2 says, But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Jor- Joram, sister of Haziah, took Joash, the son of, of Haziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered. And they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah so that he was not killed. Notice there, she doesn't just take the son, she takes his nurse with him. And they go and they hide him. The Bible says here in a moment they're going to hide him for six years. How long does it last when you try to hide something? I'm not saying when we hide something we forget where it's at. You know, sometimes we hide a Christmas gift or a birthday present somewhere. And then we find it a year later saying, oh, that's where that was. That's not hiding it for six years. That's hiding and forgetting it. But can you imagine the effort it would take to hide a son, a crying baby, a nurse for six years? Look at verse 3. We find the preservation of the king. So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Six years. I can't imagine what it would take to hide a child for six years. The dedication, the effort, the security, the steps they took to make sure they were not found out. That is a long time to hide a child. But why do they do so? Because if they didn't, the child would be dead. And possibly his nurse would have been, could have been executed as well. But we know for sure the child would have been killed. Why? Because he was a rightful heir to the throne. And so they hid him and his nurse. And the Bible says there for six years. And so she would provide protection and upbringing for the child. But not just hers. We'll see in a moment her, her husband also knew of it. So no doubt he would be part of it as well. Provide protection for this child and for the nurse for six years. And so they would be hidden for that period of time. Again, no small endeavor. Working together with her husband, we find here in 2 Chronicles 22, verse 11. So Jehoshaphat, there's that alternate spelling, a daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoda, the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so, they, so that she did not kill him. The husband knew, obviously, the child was going to be there, right? I mean, she couldn't hide it from her husband for six years. It wouldn't be godly to do so anyway. Well, see, the moment's clear that she didn't. And so they're both looking after this child and this nurse for a period of six years. Well, let's keep reading here. We find next what I call the arrival of the rightful king. Now, I love, I guess you call them kind of medieval movies, I guess. The knights, you know, the kings, you know, the... All that type of thing. And when, so when I read through this, I picture in my mind the arrival of the rightful king and the actions that would have taken place and the bravery of all the men and women involved in it. Look with me at Second Kings chapter 20, excuse me, Second Chronicles chapter 23, and beginning in verse 1. We'll notice here, it's interesting notice to point out here the name Joash, which is the rightful heir to the throne. The name Joash actually means given by the Lord, which to me is interesting because he is given by the Lord. He's protected by, no doubt the Lord, but also by this woman and her husband. And he's going to be given as what? He's going to be given and appointed king. You think the Lord played a hand in this? Well, absolutely. Second Chronicles 23, beginning of verse 1. In the seventh year, Jeho- uh, in the seventh year Jehoda strengthened himself. And made a, co- made a covenant with the captains of hundreds. Now, if we think about this for a moment, Jehoda is the husband of Jehoshaphat. He is the husband of, of the wife who's taken care of this child and the nurse for six years. Now, it's interesting to me, the Bible says in verse 1, he strengthened himself. Now, I think, to me, I think of he said, you know what? It's time to do something. You might say he 
he emboldened himself. He, he persuaded himself it's time to act. And he, the Bible says there in verse 1, he made a covenant with the captains of hundreds. Azariah, the son of Jehoram, Ishmael, the son of Jehoram, Azariah, the son of Obed, uh, Messiah, the son of Adadai, and El- Elzaphat, the son of uh, Zikri. And they went throughout Judah, Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the chief fathers of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. And so he goes out and he gathers all these men up. What is he about to do? He's about to basically storm the palace or, or, or the throne room and place the rightful king on his throne. Verse 3, Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. And he said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has said of the sons of David, saying what? We're going to make sure this happens. The Lord promised it. We have saved this man. It's time for us to put this child on the throne. As he says there in verse 3, As the Lord has said of the sons of David. Now we continue reading. We find in verse 11, And they brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, and gave him the testimony, and made him, and made him king. And Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, Long live the king. Now could they do that? Well, he's a rightful king. Absolutely they could do that. But there's one little problem. It's that evil queen. We find in verse 21, the Bible says, so all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet, for, the, for they had slain Athaliah with a sword. What are they talking about? They killed the evil queen. Now, if we back up before this, we find that she comes in and starts shouting out, treason, treason. But who is she shouting at? The rightful king and all the soldiers standing by. You think she got very far? The Bible records she didn't. They bound her, they took her out, and they killed her by the sword. They made the rightful king the rightful king. What are some lessons for us today from this? This may sound odd at first, but we must say, try to save the innocent from harm. We must try to save the innocent from harm. What do we mean by that? We, must, we do this by teaching our children about God. We do this by teaching our children about God. We do this by setting the right example. You think the young child, those six years he was hidden, was taught about God? Absolutely. He was taught about God. We also must teach our children about God. We must also set the right example. And we will show others what is right, even in uncertain times. You know, there are some today, I'm sure they're out there in our country, non-Christians, you probably say, you know, it's really dangerous for you Christians. You're getting shut up a lot. Why don't you shut your doors and just go home? Well, that's not what God requires of us to do, is it? We go and look at the New Testament, we find it's not uncommon for Christians to die for their faith. Does that mean we desire to do so? No. But we cannot be stop being who we ought to be. We cannot stop being a Christian because of the uncertainty that is around us. And so we can save our children, save the innocent from harm by teaching our children about God, by setting the right example, and by showing others what is right, even when we are living in uncertain times. We understand that doing what is right can be a risk. It is very clear today. It has been for a long time, even before we start reading about all these things taking place. We know being a Christian is always going to be a risk. It may not be physical harm, but if you talk to someone about the Bible, if they're proclaiming to be a Christian from a denomination, you don't get very far before you say something that offends them, are you? Let's talk about worship. Well, you're not going to like that. Let's talk about salvation. You're really not going to like that. Let's talk about the church, its organization. You're not going to like that either. We offend people by doing what? By teaching what the Bible teaches. It is a risk to be a Christian, but that does not mean we do not take the risk of offending others or putting ourselves at risk. Today we live in a time when living righteously is not popular. Protecting, protecting the innocent child was dangerous when she did so. Yehoshua, what she did, she could have died for it. The queen would have caught her, she would have died for it. 
She put herself at risk to do what? To do what was right in order to save the innocent from harm. Jehoshaphat set an example of protecting, uh, protecting the innocent even at the risk of personal harm. Not only would the child would have died if they were caught, but she would have died. So we think about some lessons for us today. We must remember that doing what is right is a risk and that we must do all we can to save the innocent from harm. Yehoshua shows, a, shows great courage and determination in her actions. Being a Christian, we have to also have great determination and courage in our actions as well. When we stand up and we teach or we preach or we talk with, just talk with our neighbor or friends about the Bible, it takes courage to do so. Because if we ever talk about the Bible very much with someone who we know is not a Christian, we all know we've had that point. We get to a discussion. We know this this is not going to be enjoyable for them. Talking talk to a non-Christian who's been married four or five times, and they ask a question about marriage and divorce, and we give them a Bible answer, we run the risk of not making a very not having a friend any longer, don't we? When we tell the world there's only one God, we run the risk of harming their feelings and putting ourselves at risk. And today we run the risk of not just saying there's, not, there's only one God, but that God is the God of the Bible. We run the risk of upsetting a very angry group of people, don't we? But it doesn't change what the truth is, does it? Doing what is right will always include courage and determination. Yehoshua was determined to see the innocent spared and we must show the same determination. She was determined that that child was not going to die. And she risked her own life doing so, not just once, but for six years she did it. And her husband with her. Friends, when we look at the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, we find people of bravery, male and female. And so let's remember that we can learn valuable lessons from Bible characters, Old Testament, New Testament, male or female, young or old. We can always learn great and valuable lessons. And Yehoshua is not is is one of those who is included in that group. She is not uh, one who will be uh, excluded from that. We can learn great lessons from her. This morning, as you think about these things, you think about the need to. Be on guard for those who are innocent and to be on guard for those who are trying to live the Christian life. We must realize it will always take great courage and determination to live a life that's pleasing to God. Because when you live a life that's pleasing to God, there are always going to be those who stand against you for doing so. But let us not be afraid to do so. Let us always stand boldly and courageously doing that which pleases God. This morning, as you think about these things, we can help you in any way. We can pray for you. Uh, if you have needs in your life, your concerns in your life, you need to have prayers about. If you have the desire to repent of sins, whatever those needs may be, you can come forward now. That's going to be sin, sing the song that's been selected.